Hey everybody, welcome to Hump Day Hangouts. Today is the 8th of December 2021 and this is episode number 369. So we have got uh, just a few more episodes left in 2021 before we uh, roll on into 2022. And uh, glad to see we got some good questions today. We've got a couple of announcements, uh, but real quick, want to of course stop, say hi to everybody. And uh, while I'm doing that, if you're here uh, and you're just watching, uh, we get it. I'm a lurker too. I, I attend like uh, videos or webinars and stuff, and I don't say stuff all the time. But if you're here, uh, say hi. Let us know what's going on. If you got a question, you'll have a minute or two uh, still to get it on the page. Um, so let's start at the top here. Chris, how are you doing today? Doing good here. Um, yeah, like it's we are getting lots of snow this night. It's already like quite stormy. So I hope I can stay on all day. But I can't wait. Like, I love snow. I'm one of the few, apparently. And um, yeah, other people like beach. I don't have anything against beach, but I don't know. Like, snow is like my thing. Love it. Nice, man. Yeah, I like both. As you can tell, I'm okay with the snow. This yeah. is where I was at this weekend. I forgot this was on, so I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> you, you know what make it, would make it even better? What's that? Nice the clouds beer? would be like just a little bit uh, moving. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I got to show you. Ah, I'm going to do that on the next Humpty Hangout. All right. All right. We got our first batch of our own beer ready, like full up, bottled up, this label, everything. Super happy about that. Very cool. Like, yeah, like definitely. fully officially to be sold and stuff. Yeah. Like maybe you could do that on the, um, that could be the one closest to uh, Christmas. We can have a, uh, some eggnog or you can have your beer and uh, do it that Ooh. way. So Bradley, how you doing today? Good, man. Busy, excited. Uh, lots of good stuff coming. Got a lot of big plans. You know, you guys, we talked about it yesterday, but um, we'll, we'll wait to reveal all that a couple more weeks. But yeah, things are good. Holidays are looking good. I think it's going to be a good holiday season and I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Nice. Hey, Aaron says, what's up? What's up, Aaron? Um, cool. Just wanted to say uh, I put on the page and I believe the link is on there as well. But if you have not gotten your GMB process checklist, grab that at gmbprocess.com. Uh, we've had a lot of people taking advantage of that, putting that to good work. It's a great checklist, step-by-step uh, -step checklist that Bradley put together. Um, so please grab that. It's free, gmbprocess.com. Now, if you want to take your digital marketing and results to the next level and you're looking for uh, what to do, how to do that, you know, who you should be spending time around, you want to be spending time around people who are doing that. They're taking their agency, they're consulting, their lead gen business, their brick and mortar business up to the next level. And that's what we have going on in our mastermind. So if you want to find out more about the Semantic Mastery Mastermind, head over to mastermind.semanticmastery.com. We've got it all broken down there. Um, and all I can say is, you know, coming up on the end of the year, for me, this is a time of a little bit of reflection, um, you know, looking back what's worked, what hasn't worked so well, what am I going to be doing next year, right? I think we all get into that, that kind of mode. And I can honestly say each year, you know, it's the people I spend the time around and the things I really focus on, not surprisingly, they get the most growth. Uh, and so for me, being a part of not only our mastermind, but of course, others, you know, in other areas, whether it's productivity, it's uh, business leadership, it's speaking, things like that, getting yourself around other people who are moving in that same direction it, it is really important. And that's one of the reasons we have the mastermind. So I think you guys probably feel the same way I do about that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what, you know, it's, I just had another call with a new mastermind member today because anybody, anytime somebody joins the mastermind, they get a 30 minute Zoom call with me or phone call, whatever they prefer. And um, I just had another call uh, today with David Hood, actually, who, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's, he's, he's a successful agency owner and um, got a bunch of lead gen and stuff. Anyway, it's just great because I was just talking about, you know, the mastermind is, uh, and, you know, I had a call yesterday with another successful agency owner who joined Valerie. And it's just been it's been great because I love having those conversations with new members to find out, you know, what they're doing in their business. Um, and also, you know, to encourage people like it is it, it truly is a mastermind. You know, it's not just that it's a bunch of people trying to learn like new stuff all the time. Like there are really successful business owners in our mastermind. And, and I love having that because it's such a wide range of like skills and business in you know the industries that they're working in and you know the types of services that they provide and all of that and I, I think you know just being around people that are ambitious and success driven uh kind of helps to encourage you know pull you along so to speak you know so 100 100 percent 
Okay. Anything else uh, I missed, guys, before we get into it? Oh, on my end, sorry. I just wanted to say, too, we've got some really cool uh, specials coming up for uh, the holidays. Uh, if you are not, somehow, if you're watching this and you are not uh, on the Semantic Mastery uh, subscriber, email subscriber newsletter list, you need to do that. You can head over to semanticmastery.com, get signed up there. Um, or if you're watching on the Hump Day Hangouts page, you can do that there. Um, another good place to go is Facebook. Uh, join the Facebook group or uh, also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, but you'll definitely want to be on that and you want to definitely be on the email list uh, to be um, notified, I guess is the word I'm searching for here, of uh, the cool stuff we got going on. That's going to be ramping up in about a week. So uh, if you're hearing this and it's uh, you know around the day that we released it, hop over to Semantic Mastery, get on the email list. We got some good stuff coming for you. Sweet. Cool. Let's do it. Okay. Sweet. Let me uh, grab the screen and we'll get into it. Also, Bradley, I like your sweatshirt. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think the first one, Rohit. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm looking to power up my press release organization page with some PBN links. What anchors would you recommend? And PBN providers. Also, are you hitting the main organization page itself or internal PR article pages? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, both. But if you're going to choose one target, then uh, the organization page is, is is my preferred target because it lists the you know the existing the the press releases that have been published are linked to from the organization page. It's like a blog index page, right? So it's like it's an archive page that has all your brand information, uh, NAP, name, address, phone number, an embedded Google map, um, the embedded website. It's got the zero by zero pixel at the bottom underneath the website embed where you can put the ID page or whatever else you want to iframe in there. Um, so it's, you know, it's a very, very powerful page to hit with links because it will not only power up your whatever's linked to from that page, meaning your website URL plus the GMB map or the Google business profile map um, and everything else that's iframed in there, but it also powers up the individual press releases because they're linked to from that page. So if you're gonna do just one target, that's it. However, I would recommend that if you understand press release silos or siloing press release, uh, PR stacking is a number of terms for it. They're all interchangeable, it means the same thing. Then it also makes sense to take specific press release silos and you know set up separate link building campaigns to hit those uh, press release URLs. I use the Press Advantage um, press release URLs, not any of the others, um, and that's just because I like to continually power up that you know the 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 press releases on the Press Advantage domain as well as like I said, it kind of flows back through to the organization page, right? Because if you look at the individual press releases published on the Press Advantage domain there's always a link back to the organization page on that as well. And then also the most recently published press releases are at the bottom too. So again, hitting individual press releases can also flow back to the organization page. What I'm talking about with the silos is if you have a specific keyword set or keyword theme that you're trying to power, you know, boost or get a, to, to optimize for, then when you do a press release silo and you target that keyword cluster, right? Now you've got all the press releases that you could target with a very set specific type of link building and anchor text that are relevant, super relevant, hyper relevant to that particular keyword theme, right? So that, that topic cluster. And so again, it just depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Now, if you're just trying to do a general powering up of the press advantage uh, organization itself, um, and you're not going after a specific topic cluster, for example, or keyword set, um, then yeah, you can then you can just power up the organization page, which is what I would I would do, and I always start with that to begin with. Uh, so PBN providers, you know, there's there's a number of them that I I like. Um, some good pro PBN providers for tier two PBN links is RankClub.io. Uh, RankClub.io. Um, that one's pretty good. Um, I've I've tested that on a few, and I like it. There's also some really good providers on Legit. Uh, L e g i i t dot com. Um, I've been testing a whole lot of providers over there last few months now. Um, I found a, a, a few. I'm not going to reveal my favorites here at Hump Day Hangout. That's more stuff that I reveal in the mastermind. We're on one-on-one -on -one conversations if you uh, join the mastermind. <laughs> I was just talking about how I had my one-on-one -on -one call with David today, and I, I uh, David's uh, a, a good guy, and I, get, I, I revealed a couple of my inside sources to him today. 
Um, so yeah, there's benefits. Membership has its benefits, I should say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as far as anchor text guys, like, you know, if you're hitting the organization page, go with brand and URL to begin with. Um, that makes sense guys. Remember when you're, when you're powering up tier one assets, in other words, when you're building links to tier one assets, they're branded assets, right? So it still makes sense to use a lot of brand slash URL anchors. And those are, um, in the same anchor text category. Um, if you guys have gotten our get what you formerly the Google, my business, uh, process checklist, right? GMB process. Now it, it should be updated to GBP Google business process checklist, or excuse me. Google business profile checklist. <laughs> That's a mouthful. It's going to take a while to get used to that. But anyways, um, you'll know that I talk about, you know, the, the, the five different types of anchor text categories uh, that I, I basically learned these types of anchor text categories from Matt Diggity. Uh, but that's brand slash URL is one, right? Then there's topic anchors, which are keyword anchors. Then there's target anchors, which is keyword plus location modifier. Then there's miscellaneous anchors, which are the same as generics. Uh, and then there's empty or frame anchors, which are, you know, like an iframe is an empty anchor or a frame anchor, uh, an image, a hyperlinked image without alt text. If it has alt text, the alt text is the anchor text. So then it's, that would fall into another type of anchor text category, right? Depending on what the alt text is. So, but if it's a, if it's an image link without an alt text, then it's an empty anchor. Uh, also a redirect, a redirect. So a 301 redirect is an empty anchor or, 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 or a frame anchor. Like it goes into that same category, if that makes sense. So there's five different types of anchor text categories that I classify any type of anchor in to one of those five categories. And so, like I said, when powering up tier one branded assets, uh, it makes sense to build naked URL or brand, you know, brand slash URL anchors to those because it's a branded asset, right? That might not make sense if you were like building tier two links to just a tier one link, but a branded asset link, it makes sense to do that because it's clearly about the brand. It's been optimized for the brand. So um, that's always good. But here's what I like about, you know, using tier one entity assets as a the primary targets instead of the money site for link building, because you can get away with doing a lot more target type anchors, with, right? So I don't like building links directly to the money site itself with any sort of target anchors, maybe, you know, a handful, a couple of them here and there. And again, I talk about this in some of the training uh, that I've done in some, uh, the mastermind and other areas, I get into a lot more specifics about it, but with something like, you know, press advantage, the organization page, it's got high authority. Um, it's going to have a follow link from the NAP section of the organization page back to whatever website you put in there as uh, the primary website for the organization page. Uh, it's got the GMB map embed, right? It's got the, then your primary website URL is going to be iframed at the bottom as long as it's on SSL, right? HTTPS, it'll, it'll iframe into the bottom. And so my point is you can hit that page with some target anchors, keyword plus location, right? Um, and you can push that through the naked URLs and the iframes, kind of that relevance through without it being the same as if you were building target anchors directly to your money site. Does that make sense? Because you got to be real careful with that, guys. Again, I've, I've talked about this in, in various venues where I've, I've, I've trained about the Google business process checklist. But if you go do an, an, an in the process checklist, when you get to the uh, tier one link building, there's a, a, a local link building workbook template that you can copy into your drive account. And I give an example in there. There's the data template, which is the first sheet that has, you know, the formulas and everything else in there. Uh, where you just, it, it talks, you know, and you go in and you, you, you just go do an analysis of your top 10 ranked competitors for whatever search query it is you're, you're targeting or you're optimizing for. Uh, the second tab in that sheet uh, was just a sent, or that second sheet in the workbook, I should say, is uh, just an example. I think I used Tree Service Baltimore was the keyword there. And it shows examples of that. So what we're looking at in there are the top ranked local business websites for whatever search query it is you're optimizing for. Not Directory sites, that's comparing apples to oranges. We want to compare apples to apples or oranges to oranges, not apples to oranges, right? So we, we don't even analyze the directory sites, the big directory sites. They're, 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 not, they're not truly what we're competing with. Yes, we're competing with them for space on the first page of Google. But when you, when you take a look at, um, when you try to analyze a directory site, you'll see that they have way more content on the page usually because of endless scroll. Um, there's like, I mean, by magnitude of sometimes, you know, four or five, in other words, when you're comparing local business competitor websites, you know, in the space that I'm in, which is tree services, you know, the average is probably about 
800, 850, 900 words is what you'll see. But on the directory page listings or the directory pages that are in the top 10, you'll see 3,500 words, right? You'll also see like um, a, a domain authority. And I don't mean like Moz domain authority, but like a proprietary authority. Like for example, if you're using Surfer SEO um, to analyze the SERPs, you'll notice that a lot of like the directory sites like Yelp, for example, have like an authority score of like nine. Uh, Home Advisor, Angie, or Angie's formerly Angie's List, um, Lawn Starter, which is, a, is, is another big name for, it's a directory for like home um, landscapers and lawn and tree service and stuff like that. And you'll see that they have like real high domain, like um, authority scores. And again, that's not a Moz score, but that's true as well. Moz domain authority is also real high on those. And the local business sites will have one. Their, their score will be one. On a scale of one to 10, that's one. And the, uh, the directory sites are like eight, nine, 10. Does that make sense? And the, and the, the, the difference in uh, keywords or uh, amount of words and content on the page is huge. Like I said, average for tree service contractors is somewhere between eight to 900 words, but the directory sites will have like 3,500 words. So you don't want to compare on those. So to get back to the, what I was saying was, you know, let's say you've got six local business websites on page one. Well, you go analyze the backlink profile of those. And then all, and, and, and why I like to use Majestic, guys, is over any other the, the other tools is Majestic has a filter built in that just filters out links. It doesn't even display them. I guess if you go into the historical index, you can see them. But if you're looking at the fresh index, they have filters in place that like by default filter out all the real low quality links that really provide no value. Um, there's so so all you're looking at are any links that really produce re, really push any link equity at all, right? And so that's why I like to use Majestic. I, I've tested Majestic versus Ahrefs or Ahrefs versus Moz Pro um, versus um, you know other tools that I've looked at too. But uh, and out of all of them, my favorite is is Majestic because of that. It really only focuses on the links that are really pushing any sort of power at all. And so when you when you analyze your top ranked local business competitors there. You'll at least in the space that I'm in, guys. Like you'll see that the the vast majority of top ranked local business sites have like less than 20 referring domains, which is insane, right? I mean, it's like I remember years ago, uh, you know, you'd be competing with on hundreds or even thousands of referring domains for the top ranked, and that, it's not that way anymore. Um, and so, what I'm saying is, then it's real easy to just go to the backlinks tab in Majestic or whatever tool you're using. And you can just scan down. It's a manual process. I haven't haven't built any tools for this yet, but it's a manual process. But you can just scroll, scroll on down and look at the anchor text types for each one of the links. It just categorizes. So again, if it's less than, and by the way, when I say backlinks in referring domains, I look at referring domains, not backlinks, because you could have 50 backlinks from one domain and there's going to be one backlink from that domain that is weighted the heaviest and the rest are not as powerful or given as much credit. So all I when I when I look at number of backlinks, I'm really looking at number of referring domains. So if there's less than 20 referring domains, then I'll just scroll on down and the most notable the most notable backlink from any one domain is always going to be the one displayed in Majestic. Does that make sense? So whatever the anchor text is for that link, that becomes the anchor it, it, I I play, you know, I categorize it that way. So like I said, if I've got, you know, say 20 referring domains, then I'll just scroll on down, I'll start at the top and I'll just count Okay, that's a brand, that's a URL, and I'll just, you know, old school, like, and I'll get down to the bottom of 20 and I'll say, okay, I've got, you know, seven brand slash URL anchors. So I mark it off, seven. Then I'll go back to the top and I'll scroll on down. As I'm going down, I'll count the number of topic anchors, which are very few. It's interesting, but very few topic anchors. Remember, topic anchors are just keywords. Then I'll go back to the top and I'll scroll down. And as I'm scrolling down, I'll count target anchors, which is keyword plus location modifier. You'll see a couple of those in there, unless it's a real spammy site. And every now and then you'll see a spammy site and you'll see a ton of those. But for the most part, most organic ranked, top ranked uh, local business sites have a very natural looking link profile. Um, and again, I just keep going through that process. And what I've found in my testing uh, and from an analyzing hundreds of, of sites over the last several months in the tree service space primarily, um, is that about 60 to 85 percent of the a backlink anchor text ratios are 60 to 85% are in the brand slash URL category. Then about, you know, 15 to 20% are in the miscellaneous category, which is generics like click here, website, read more, uh, you know, all those types of terms. 
Um, and then there's usually just a, a, there's a small percentage, usually about five to five to 10 percent of frame or empty anchors, um, which, again, come from redirects, iframes and uh, image links with no alt text. And then there's a very, very small percentage, usually between five to 10 percent of target anchors and virtually zero topic anchors. I mean, occasionally you'll see a, 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 an, an odd uh, topic anchor, but for the most part, I don't see those um, in backlink profiles for local businesses. So it's usually have real heavy. And that's why I say whenever in doubt, if you're not sure about what anchor text ratio to hit, just go with brand slash URL anchors. So I tell all of you this or tell you all of this, because when you're, when you're talking about the press advantage organization page or any really branded tier one asset, you can go heavier there on target anchors, especially if the if the link from the tier one asset that's linking to your money site is a brand slash or you brand slash URL anchor, if it's one of those, right? Um, or a miscellaneous or a frame, like an empty anchor, then you can target the, you know, you can hit that tier one asset with target anchors so that you can push kind of a more powerful link equity with that 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 keyword relevance into that 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 asset, which flows through a miscellaneous frame or brand slash URL anchor to the money site. Does that make sense? So I, I, I know that was kind of a long-winded answer, but I want you guys to understand like my methodology on link building, um, which is, you know, to try to keep all the tier one assets kind of linking to the money site with, I go real heavy on brand slash URL anchors. And once I get that, you know, up, then what I'll do is I'll strategically build target anchors to the money site if needed, but I prefer to try to get the push that I want by building anchor text, uh, target anchor text links at from tier two to tier one. Does that make sense? And so, um, you know, again, you can analyze some of your top ranked competitors, like I just said, use the, the workbook template that I give you guys in the Google process checklist um, and, and just go, go start analyzing, guys. The more that you, especially if you're in a single industry, it makes it easy because you'll start to see kind of a commonality, like trends within that industry as to what is working. And that's what you mimic, right? You meet and then exceed that. In other words, you try to get your anchor text ratio close to what the ratio, the average ratio is of the top ranked competitors and just get close. You don't got to be exact. Just get close. And again, when in doubt, always go heavy on brand slash URL anchors. And then you start doing all of your target anchor link building out at tier two to your tier one assets. And that's just the safest way in the world that you can do it. Um, however, one last thing I want to mention about that is that I've noticed um, Google's gotten a hell of a lot better, guys, about just discrediting links that aren't that are from sources that aren't topically relevant. So, in other words, it used to be where you could go out and just buy, you know, you, you could buy a link on a high-powered page, uh, or you know, place a link on a high-powered page, whatever. And if the if the if it wasn't fully topic if it wasn't topically relevant to what the, the target URL was from that page, you would still get a boost from it. What, excuse me, what I've been finding over the last couple of months now is I can go out and, and purchase a link or place a link somewhere that has got really, really, really strong metrics, no matter what kind of metrics they are. But if the page that I'm placing that link on isn't relevant to what the target URL is that I'm trying to build the link to, then I get little to no boost from that at all. So it's not worth the effort. In other words, uh, you know, if, if, and, and Google's algorithm, I think, has gotten better at determining that. Like, and that's a way to beat spam, right? To combat spam and combat what we do as SEOs, which is to, you know, if we can find somewhere that's a, a strong page by metrics, which are usually proprietary metrics, you know, PADA, domain rank, uh, trust flow, citation flow, whatever, whatever metrics you use, you can go out and get a link there. And yeah, you might be able to boost your metrics, but does it provide a boost in the SERP, right? Does it pr provide positive SERP movement, right? Or positioning? And if not, then what good are the metrics? Does that make sense? Um, and so what I found is there are ways, uh, there are ways to, to, to improve that, which I'm not going to disclose here for sure, but there are ways to disclose that. What I think, what I'm trying to get at here is what's more important is to find links from more relevant, relevant sources if possible. And that does make things a lot harder, but if you can get a link from a relevant source that might, if it's relevant, it, even if the metrics are a lot lower than say a, uh, an alternative source where you could get a link that the metrics are much higher, but it's not relevant. If you can get a link from a lower, you know, a less strong uh, metric type of, uh, you know, uh, platform or website or page or whatever, but it's more relevant, that produces a better result. 
And that that's the way that I, I mean, I've seen that time and again over the last several, several months. Um, and, you know, boosting metrics is, is nice, I guess. There's, you know, there's, I guess it's, it's cool to see that, but if it's not moving SERPs, what difference does it make? So I think having topical relevance is actually way more important than just any sort of particular metric. I know that was a long answer, but I thought that was a good question. So thank you for that question. Mike says, if you have a site with different subdomains, so links hitting the subdomain URL pass authority over to the root domain. Well, yeah, passes domain authority, Moz, a Moz metric. Um, we used to years ago do um, a lot of domain authority manipulation using precisely that method. We would build a subdomain, we'd no index the subdomain, but then you could just smash the subdomain with like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of spam links. And it would boost the domain authority because that, you know, it transfer the domain authority sub the domain authority is domain wide. Does that make sense? That includes subdomains. Page authority varies by page, but domain authority is an aggregate of all of the pages and subdomains, right? So uh, yeah, you could do that. And, um, you know, I haven't tested that in years. We got away from doing that. Um, and I haven't tested that in years. So I don't know if domain authority manipulation would really help anything at this point. As I just mentioned, I, I have been doing some like trust flow manipulation and I found exactly what I just mentioned in the previous uh, question, which was unless I'm getting trust flow from the correct topical trust flow category, it's not moving the needle, right? And so I think that's uh, what's really important. So domain authority manipulation, what's, what's the purpose of it? Um, if you can increase domain authority from relevant sources, you're going to have a much better effect than if you're trying to just boost domain authority just to see that metric go up. I mean, you can certainly do that. There's no question. But if is it going to provide a benefit, or is it just an exercise in in uh, you know ego to 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 show that you boosted domain authority metrics? So it's like, what is, what is the intent of doing that? Is what I'm asking. Um, but yes, if you power up a subdomain, uh, remember domain authority is a domain wide metric. So that means all of its uh, child domains or subdomains are going to inherit whatever the domain authority score is. It's um, of the domain itself, okay? Page authority is what varies depending on page, whatever page it's on. Okay, uh, Pradeep says, hey guys, I saw a competitor that has a Facebook page for every target location alongside their main branded page. The pages of syndicate content are the exact same, just the page title. Do you think this is a good idea or just spammy? I mean, I don't know. I don't, uh, maybe it's a Facebook thing. They're trying to generate traffic from Facebook. I don't know. Cause I don't, I don't try to generate face traffic from Facebook at all. Um, I just, I hate Facebook always have, <laughs> and I don't think that's going to change. Um, but you know, for SEO purposes, I, I don't really know why they would do that either. Um, so do I think it's a good idea or just spammy? I, I I don't even care if it's spammy. It's Facebook. Who cares? Facebook is a cesspool anyways. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, I, I don't have a good answer for you, Pradeep, because I don't know. I don't know what the purpose of that would be unless they're trying to generate. I don't know if it would help with SEO at all or hurt for that matter. Um, it might just be some sort of technique that they're trying to, you know, or tactic that they're trying to generate more traffic from Facebook. I really don't know. Interesting, though. <laughs> I am more business says uh, I ordered the SEO power shield but have since changed the domain. Are you guys able to help me update the domain? And if so, what service do I order? Um, you're gonna have to contact the heavy hitter club for that. Uh, we are no longer associated with them. In other words, like it's not part of Semantic Mastery anymore. It was, but um, Rob and Marco split from us a couple of months ago now and they took the store with them. So that's up to them. Um, as far as, are you able to update the domain? And if so, I think they can. Um, you just have to contact their support and ask them that question. I'm pretty sure they can. They're going to have to charge you something to do it. But I, and again, I, I don't don't swear to this because I can't answer for them anymore, guys. That I don't. They're not part of Semantic Mastery now, so I don't know what changes have been made to their operation or anything else. So I would say just contact them, um, and they'll. I'm sure Rob and Rusail, the, the support manager over there, will will get you sorted or provide you with the best option. Okay. Adam says, question from Facebook, what hosting do you recommend and why for ourselves or clients? Anyone to stay away from? Okay, yes, that's a great question. Um, so we have, you know, I don't like to bad mouth places, but we had for years promoted Liquid Web and they were an outstanding uh, hosting company for a long time, but apparently they got bought out by somebody. 
and their uh, support went to shit. Like you, like like none I've ever. I mean, as bad as GoDaddy hosting or or HostGator or any others. Um, their support went to total shit. We had our site hack, Semantic Mastery, in I think February of this year. Is that right, Adam? Yep. Yeah, sorry, I was reading something. What was the exact question? I think we had the site hacked in February, the first week in February. Yeah, I can't Somewhere recall. It was earlier this year, but it stretched on forever. Almost six weeks. Yeah. Yep, almost six weeks. Our site was down for a month, and uh, and it took, like, a site hack, guys. I've had that happen to clients and some of my own stuff over the years, and usually with no more than two or three days, tops. And the site's been 100% restored. Took them six weeks. Our site was down for a month. Then I had another. I had a client site um, that same thing. He'd been on Liquid Web for like 10 years. And uh, this was just two, two months ago now. Um, I had a client site that got hacked. And, it, and it, his site went down for four days. Four entire days. So anyway, long story short, we used to promote Liquid Web. I don't recommend them at all anymore. And that's their fault because they used to be outstanding and they're no longer, their support sucks. It takes them three times as long to do what most hosting, what, what a decent hosting company can do. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 and so what I started using, I don't know, three, four years ago now as just one of many different hosting accounts was WPX, uh, which is owned and operated by Terry Kyle. And any of you guys that have been around for a long time would recognize Terry Kyle's name. Um, anyways, uh, he started a hosting company a, a while back and it's now called WPX. And I started using them probably three, maybe four years ago as one of many different hosting accounts. And I have since, except for SEO hosting for some specific projects, um, I've moved every one of my money sites on the WPX and my client sites. And I recommend WPX to all my clients. The, the one that I was just telling you about from two months ago was a roofer, roofing client. Uh, he had his site hacked and was down for four days. Um, I, I, it was a nightmare working with Liquid Web. And so I, I contacted him and said, look, as soon as Liquid Web restores your site, I'm going to migrate it to WPX. Go, go buy WPX here. Um, WPX is great. Their support is outstanding. I've only had one issue with WPX the entire, in the four years that I've worked with them. And that was earlier this year. They had their, um, something happened with one of their upstream providers or whatever. And sites were completely unreachable in WPX for about five hours, but they got it fixed. And then Terry Kyle, the owner of WPX and founder of it, sent out you know, a long email the next day apologizing and explaining what happened and saying that's not an excuse. We are putting redundancies in place now to make sure that this never happens again. And I'm telling you, I've never had as good of support as WPX at any time of the day or night. If you have a problem, you can go on to WPX in live chat and within you know, 10, 15 seconds, you got somebody there working on your problem. Um, it doesn't have a normal cPanel, but you still have file manager, MySQL database, all that other stuff. Um, I just think it's an outstanding service. And like I said, I've, I've, I've moved all of my client sites and uh, lead gen projects, except for SEO hosting, but all, and I recommend to all my clients WPX hosting. I think it's an outstanding hosting service and um, their speed is really good. And, and one of the other cool features about them is that they have a speed opt, uh, they'll do a site opt, you know, site speed optimization for every site in your account. You get it one time free for every domain that's hosted on their uh, and they're hosting and it's, it's phenomenal. They do a really good job. They use uh, W3 total cash and they have very specific settings with their own CDN that's already baked into their hosting plans. And so they can figure all of that for you. And they do a really, really, really good job of optimizing for page speed. And that's something I've always struggled with on my own. So that's another reason why I like WPX because like, if you got a 15 website, um, you know, hosting package, then you get basically all 15 sites, get one free page speed optimization um, service. And then you can, you can always buy more if you need to, but um, I thought, always thought that was a really, really good feature too. Any comments on that guys? Okay. No, I've just been super happy ever since we uh, moved Smatic Mastery over. No issues. Yeah, no issues at all. So, okay. Key Lead says, do you create separate Google account for each Google business profile lead gen property? If so, what's the best way to do this? Buy phone verified accounts or create a new account under an existing Google account? No, I don't, um, you know, because I do a lot of uh, single brand, but multiple location stuff. 
So what I, what I do is, you know, I like to set up um, several lead gen locations underneath one brand. And then what I'll do is I'll purchase, and, and, and I've talked about this before, guys, I can't reveal all my secrets here. <laughs> it's something hangouts. I talk about this stuff in the mastermind, but I, I like to set up Google workspace accounts. All you need is the basic or starter account, whatever it's $6 per month. Okay. So set up a Google workspace account. And here's the other thing, register a domain through Google, Google domains. So Google uh, domains.google is, is the, is Google's domain registrar. It costs 15 bucks instead of 11 at Namecheap, right? But when you set up, when you buy a domain through Google domains that you can use, uh, uh, first of all, you're, 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 you're buying a domain through Google. So you have to submit your credit card information and all that to purchase it, right? Register it. But through the checkout process, it's just a checkbox. And it will, you just check a box if you want to add workspace to that domain. And so if you've ever set up Google Workspace on your own, you know you got to mess with MX records and in and all that wherever you're uh, wherever you're managing your DNS, whether that's your registrar or Cloudflare or whatever. You got to go in and do all the MX records, and then you have to add your SPF records, your DMARC records, your DKIM, all of that stuff. If you want to have email deliverability and all these things, and it's it's kind of a pain in the ass. And um, but if you if you just check the box as you're purchasing or registering a domain through Google Domains for the basic starter workspace account or whatever, then they'll set it up automatically and it, it works right out of the box, right? You don't have to do anything else. It, it adds all those records and everything um, that you need for emailing, deliver for email deliverability and all that kind of stuff. And then what I'll do is I will register the GMBs underneath that workspace account. And because like I said, most of what I do is I, I build brands that have multiple locations. Um, and so I'll, I'll register several locations under that Google Workspace account, okay? And then what happens if I want to continue to expand and I get to a point where I'm starting to get uneasy about how many locations I have in that particular manager account or owner account, I should say, then what I'll do is I'll go into that Google Workspace account, log, you know, log into that, then go to Google Domains again, and I'll purchase that same domain name, but with a different extension, .net, .org, whatever, and I'll select workspace on that as well. Does that make sense? So now, uh, and so so then I'll end up having the same domain, but with a different domain extension, and that'll become a secondary Google Workspace account. It's another six bucks a month, but it's inexpensive. And then I'll go register multiple GMBs underneath that. Does that make sense? And that way I, I, I'm kind of separating them out, but I found that Google gives you a lot more leeway if you are a workspace account owner. Like in other words, if you're paying for that, um, and I think it's because it validates it. You know, if you go out and buy phone verified accounts, free Gmail accounts, and then start registering GMB is like, it's in my opinion, just having that credit card on file makes it a lot less spammy. And it, it kind of raises the threshold with which Google will suspend your account. Does that make sense? Um, and, and I've, I've had, I've been really successful doing it that way. I've not really had any suspensions when I, tried to manage multiple accounts as an owner under one G, uh, Gmail account, not a workspace account. I have seen expen uh, suspensions, but not under workspace accounts. So, I mean, you tell me, uh, have, I, have I proven one way or the other? No, except that again, through my own experience under Gmail accounts, free Gmail accounts, um, I've experienced suspensions, you know, not two, not, you know, dozens and dozens, but I've experienced several suspensions over the last few years. But in under workspace accounts, none, not a single one. And that's knock on wood. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, JK says, do you know of any sources that will teach how to create the GMB listing? Um, well, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, we, we teach how to just go get the GMB process checklist. That's how you create list. I mean, if you're talking about how to register and verify a listing, um, no, I don't know of any that do that. Um, none that, None that have any longevity. Here's the thing, guys. If somebody teaches you how to spam verify a GMB listing and they sell it as a course, guess what happens? A bunch of people start doing it and it gets it gets terminated. That that ability, that way of verifying GMBs gets terminated. Every time anybody has sold a course on how to black hat verify GMBs, that method gets shut down in a matter of weeks, sometimes months, but very rarely. It's usually weeks. And so why build a business on uh, a way that is very likely going to be terminated and means you're going to lose all the work that you put in? I mean, I've heard horror stories in some of the SEO groups 
about people that had used like the pin drop method, the phone verification or claiming non, you know, un, unclaimed GMBs and all that kind of stuff. And they did it for dozens and some, in some cases, hundreds and hundreds of GMB locations just to have that loophole closed and everything suspended. That's not how I want to build a business. You know what I mean? Um, I've had that. I've had um, some GMB stuff suspended, but I've had, you know, when I was doing a lot of mass page build stuff, um, I had, you know, we had one time in one night overnight, we had 175 uh, mass page build sites de-indexed in a night. And that's part of the reason I stopped doing those kind of those types of site builds is because I said, I don't like turn and burn. I like if I'm going to put effort, money and, you know, time, money and effort into uh, uh, building assets, I want them to produce, you know, I want them to have longevity, right? Long, I want them to produce long term. I don't I don't like the churn and burn shit. If I did, then I would do mass page stuff. I would do launch jacking, affiliate marketing, it's, you know, not launch jacking is kind of churn and burn. Right. Um, anyway. So I don't I don't know of anybody that teaches any courses like that 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 are worth it because it's any and even if I did if I told you then you'd start trying to use their method and likely would get shut down and next thing you know you you would have lost all your time and effort and money both in verifying GMB listings that got suspended as well as the course that you spent the money on so I don't recommend it do PO boxes virtual offices and UPS still work PO boxes absolutely still work um, they absolutely work there's a drawback to it though which is you have to physically go to the post office and produce two forms of identification. I always just use my driver's license and my um, vehicle registration card, but you have to go to the physical post post office and sign the documents, produce two forms of ID, sign the documents, and then they read, they, they issue you the box number. Uh, and then you got to go register the GMB. And then you have to go back to the pro- post office, you know, a week to 10 days later, to try to get the verification card. And if it's not there, then you got to go back to your house or wherever and re- register or uh, request the card again and then go back. How do I know? So I've done a lot of that <laughs> over the years. Um, but PO boxes absolutely still work if you use the street address option. Um, and that is a valid way to get them. It still works to this day. I just registered another one like three weeks ago. Um, and just to show you guys real quick, look, this is the easiest way to do it too. Go to usps.com. You want to go to um, rent or renew a PO box under quick tools. What you're going to do is put in your zip code of wherever you want to do it. So I don't know, let's do uh, 22033. I think that's Fairfax, Virginia. And what happens is you put the zip code in where you want to have the GMB location. And what it'll do is it's going to show you and it'll show you, uh, you know, how far from that, the, what, is determined as the center of that zip code that post office is. And you can register the, the PO box online. They won't give you the box number, but you can reserve it and pay for it online. And then they'll, and through the, here's the thing though, in order to be able to use the street address option, the PO box that you select has to have this premium PO box of services available. If it does not say premium PO boxes, pre, premium PO box services right there, then they won't allow you to use the street address option. And that's that's the trick to the, doing PO boxes is, and but what's nice about it, if it does have that option, then with, when you go to reserve that, let's just say I wanted to reserve this one, excuse me, let's click this. Then what I do is I get the real small one right there. And so uh, I register it for three months, which forces you to go on auto renew with a credit card if you do that, but all you do is cancel it before the 90 days. Um, and so you register it for, for, for three months. I always go with the smallest one because all you're trying to do is get a postcard. And then through the checkout process, there's a, bo- a box that you check that says, you know, enable or uh, yeah, enable premium PO box services. Doesn't cost anything else. You just check a box and then it will give you the PDF forms that you print out that are already filled out, except for your signature, um, including the uh, additional form with the premium PO box services selected. And then you take those, print them out, take them to the post office with two forms of ID, like I said, you know, passport or whatever. And then something, uh, I use my driver's license and vehicle registration card. I've always used those. Um, and when you go to the post office, you, they'll, once you show them your IDs and you sign the paperwork in front of them, they'll give you the, assign the box number. And then they'll give you, in this case, it would be 10660 Page Avenue. Then whatever the box number is, that's what you would use. So that would be your address right there, if that makes sense. Um, And that works. But again, you have to go back and forth to the post office to do that. So 
But um, that's the only way that I would recommend doing that right now. All right. Okay, Carl says, hey, Samantha Mastery, wondering if it's a good idea to regularly build mass web 2.0 links at the GMB website URL, not the map, but the mini site they give you. Uh, yes and no. I mean, look, I, I, I talk about this often, guys. Again, going back to, and I'm just going to have to pull this up. We got 15 minutes. So let me just go back to Process Street for a minute. Which, by the way, I'm moving everything into Flowster, which, guys, I put this over here. Sign up for a free account if you already haven't. Uh, you, you may have from the Black Friday to Cyber Monday special, which was free. We gave away the content mirroring process in Flowster. But I would recommend you guys sign up for that because anything that I, I'm, I'm, I'm moving all of my process training into Flowster um, and uh, anything that I, we give out as far as like training or processes are all going to be in Flowster going forward. And again, you can have a free account there. Um, we had somebody a couple of weeks ago bitch about... Um, the, the free template I was giving away saying, well, it's not free if you got to pay for Flowster, but they clearly have a free account. <laughs> so anyway, just go check it out. But um, so this will be over there with, I'm, I'm working on some other processes right now, but when I'm done, I'm going to push all of this in the Flowster. Anyway, that said, if we go here, guys, as I mentioned, this right here, I, tr I like to treat the location landing page, the self-hosted site, the GMB website or Google business profile website now, and the GMB CID map URL is money sites. So tier zero, right? Ground zero. Um, so I don't like to just spam away at the GMB website anymore. You, you know, used to do it, uh, but I like to try to keep them clean now. So I, you know, it's up to you. Web 2.0 links are, they're not as spammy as like form profile links and all the kind of GSA kitchen sink spam stuff that you could throw at it. Um, but I, you know, I prefer not to do that. I prefer at least maybe at the post level, Google business profile posts, but the root domain, which is really a subdomain on the dot business dot site, whatever that like the homepage URL for the uh, Google business profile website. I like to keep that really clean, just like I do my, um, you know, money site or location landing page. So, I mean, yeah, you can do it. And guys, I know a lot of people that are still just spamming away on those and getting away with it. I just, I feel like at some point, and I could be totally wrong. I feel like at some point it could be an issue. And I just, I like to try to keep those clean because again, talking about the processes that I, I teach, right. And, and especially here, we talk about the tier one content, you know, tuning all the content on branded profiles and all of that. And those are the assets that you can just smash with links, but I like to treat these. So in other words, these pro properties out here can just be hammered away with whatever kind of links you want to throw with them. But what I like to do is keep these really clean. Right. Um, and that's just the way I do it. And again, GM Google business posts, that's a little bit different. You know, you build a, a, a post silo, like I talk about that right here. There's diagrams in there for that as well, like a push silo, for example. If you want to hammer away at these, that's different. And um, I know those are like inner pages, but I like to treat the root of like to so the home page, essentially the landing page, the Google business profile website landing page. Um, I like to treat that as if it was a money site now. Right. Keep it really clean. And the same goes for the uh, the CID map URL. Um, it's funny. I was just talking to, uh, like I said, one of the new mastermind members today. And he had heard in some other SEO groups and stuff that building links to the CID map can actually cause problems uh, and hurt ranking uh, maps ranking. And that may be true. But if you're spamming away at the CID map, I know that wasn't your question, but I'm, uh, that's part of the reason. Like, cause he asked, well, have you experienced that? And I said, no, but I've been for, for months now, I've been treating that as if it were a money site, right? Which means the links that I build to it are very strategic and very clean. Um, I don't do mass links to any of these. So, and what the links that I do build, I try to get topical relevance is the number one key. Um, you know, that's the key metric I look for is relevance now, not just metrics, like not just, um, Domain authority, page authority, trust flows, citation flow, any of that. I, I, like that to me isn't important as topical relevancy. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, okay. Ashish says, hey guys, is Menterprise a good tool? What do you think? Mass page marketing, does it work? Thanks. I don't know, but I know Daryl Ledyard over at Mass Page Tools is crushing it with, he's, um, he's a really big advocate for that tool. I used it briefly when I was doing some, PBN link building using a um, link uh, a PBN network that required a bunch of content 
um, we had to produce our own content for link building and it was, it was a bitch. So uh, I, I, I tried Mentorprise for about two months as a way to generate content. And it was good for that, but that's the only thing I used it for. So um, I know there's a lot of functionality built into uh, Mentorprise that I didn't, I never used any of that. So I don't know. I don't know how good it was, um, how effective it was or anything else. I, I can't say anything good or bad about it. I mean, it was good for creating like link building content very quickly, but it still needed massaged. It wasn't, at least I, I wasn't going to publish it the way that it was. I would go through each time I would generate a spun, uh, you know, an article spun, an article spinning project to be used for link building. I would end up spending two or three hours literally going through and cleaning it up and all that. And it was a real bitch. And that's part of the reason I stopped using that particular service I was using was because I was spending like 12, 14 hours per month um, just developing content for link building. And that's just wasn't sustainable. Um, so I, I've switched and I've gone to other link building sources now so that I don't have to do that. And I canceled my enterprise. So sorry, I know it's got a lot of powerful features. I just don't use it other than what I just mentioned. Um, and I'm not using it anymore. But that's not to say it's not a good tool. What's up, Aaron? Uh, Raisa says Christmas tree time. What's up, Raisa? Uh, and that's it. Okay, here's one from YouTube. What's your best solution for implementing custom structured data to each page or article on the money site? Um, well, honestly, I'm still using Schema app, um, and that's just because I I know Rob has his uh, Schema Tech or whatever. Like he's got his training course, which is fabulous. There's no question. Rob Beal does his Schema Tech course, which is great. But that was a lot of manual schema building that I did not want to undertake. Um, so I've continued to use the Schema app, which is SchemaApp.com. It produces more advanced schema than the average schema but not nearly as advanced as what Rob teaches in his course. Um, but I didn't have the patience to do that manually. Uh, I know that Rob and Marco are, have been, it's, it was in beta. Um, I think it still is in beta, but they have a um, software that does it, like an app that generates structured data now based on Rob's methodology. Uh, but I, I did not get involved with that um, because I knew that they were splitting. So I just didn't get involved. I'm not saying anything bad about it. I haven't even used it is what I'm saying. It is probably amazing, but I did not become part of the beta test. And I don't think it's available to the public yet. If you guys have access to them, which you should in some various format, just contact Rob and ask him. Um, I, I would suggest using his app if you're looking for advanced schema. There it is. Thank you, Adam. Um, again, I'm using just for, for the industry that I'm in, as long as my schema is a little bit better than the vast majority of competitors, I'm able to get results in the tree service industry. If you're in a more competitive industry, you know, having advanced schema will absolutely help. There's, again, I was just talking to the, uh, the mastermind member that I had a call with today um, about how he, he, how he had heard, like, you know, having really well developed schema, like, he's, you know, he's talked to people that have ranked sites on schema alone. And I'm sure that can happen. Um, but it's, again, that was beyond what I needed to do for if, if it wasn't so manual, when I went through that course, I probably would have implemented more of it. Uh, and again, they're developed an app for that, that I just, I had, I haven't gotten access to. So I don't know how good it is. I'm sure it's good. Um, but for, again, for me, for the industry that I'm in, just having more advanced schema than the average, a, a lot of tree service contractor sites don't even have any structured data on them. So I could probably get away with just the standard local business and, and do well, but I still have more advanced schema that I've been able to build using schema app uh, because it does nested or connected schema items um, properly, nested connected data items properly, uh, which Rob also calls uh, node referencing. Um, so, you know, that's, again, if you're looking for really advanced stuff, then schema app is, is probably not your best bet. You're probably going to want to go with something more advanced like Rob's tool, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, but yeah, guys, schema is one of those things that like, if you're just using the, you know, the standard templates that everyone else is using, what benefit is it really providing? Right. You always have to try to exceed what your competitors are doing. So if most of your competitors don't have schema, all you got to do is basic schema. If most of your competitors have basic schema, all you have to do is slightly more advanced schema. <laughs> if all of your competitors or most of your competitors have advanced schema, well, then you better have super advanced schema, right? If you want to exceed them. And that, that's really the whole point. Like you can go, uh, you can go down the route of like, I just want to go balls out, like super advanced schema right off the bat. 
Um, and that may be great because, again, I haven't tested this, but you might be able to rank without links or anything else if that's the case. And that would be sweet. I haven't tested that just because, again, I, I didn't have the time or I, I just chose not to invest the time into going the super advanced schema route. So that's a good question. Okay. I think we're done. Anybody else? That's it. Sweet. All right, guys. Thanks for being here.